a PhD student in Randy Jackson's lab at UW-Madison, but I'm going to talk about some work from my master's degree with Matt Ruark in the soil science department. And this is all about soil organic matter. So I thought I'd start with what I'm talking about when I say soil organic matter. I'm going to be referring to all material living and dead of microbial, animal, bacterial origin. It's extremely heterogeneous. As you can see in this picture, which shows some uh, fungal hyphae surrounding some other soil particles, it's really difficult to measure precisely or to separate from the rest of the soil. So a lot of times we just measure carbon and nitrogen and use that as a stand-in for soil organic matter since that's mostly carbon. Uh, we think soil organic matter is critical because it uh, is important for soil fertility. As soil organic matter is mineralized, nutrients are released to plants. And we also think that carbon in the soil is preferable to carbon in the atmosphere where it can contribute to the greenhouse effect. So we're interested in it for that purpose. Um, my research has mostly dealt with soil aggregate organic matter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how soil aggregation occurs. I made this little cartoon. I consider that whole blob a macro aggregate. And the scale of that is about 250 microns or more. And 250 microns or a quarter millimeter might sound really small, but considering that clay particles are two microns, 250 microns in the soil is pretty large. You can see that there's these little pink blobs in my macro aggregate, and that's particulate organic matter, or POM. That particulate organic matter is the largest, freshest inputs of organic matter to the soil, um, and it can occur either inside or outside of aggregates. And you can also see that my macro aggregate is made up of smaller blobs, micro aggregates, and that inside of those I represented these clay particles as little horizontal stacked bars. So essentially there's these organic films, the yellow circles around the, um, the blobs, and that's holding things together. And the particulate organic matter may also be sticky or become covered with uh, sticky bacterial exudates or root exudates and hold things together. The root hair is important in larger aggregates. Fungal hyphae and other stringy structures may also be physically holding things together like, like string. However, over time, everything does decompose, and you have new sticky material coming in and different aggregate formations coming together. So it's actually a really dynamic process. This can occur over you know, days, hours, and over that time, some material is released um, and mineralized, and uh, some new material is stabilized inside aggregates. So the main takeaways uh, from this for, that I want you to remember are that uh, organic matter is the critical part of stabilizing soil aggregates. As far as we know, that is the glue that makes soil aggregation happen. Um, and secondly, these macro aggregates are much more vulnerable to disturbance than micro aggregates. Those big pieces of root hairs and fungal hyphae are much more likely to get broken up versus organic films or that particulate organic matter is less likely to be disturbed by tillage. And last, uh, physical protection is a critical part of stabilizing soil organic matter in general. This little conceptual model shows at the bottom some biochemically protected carbon, which is literally difficult to break down because of its chemistry. But then you have a huge pool of material that's physically protected. And even simple compounds like sugars and proteins can persist in the soil for a long time if they're physically protected. So it's an important part of building soil organic matter. So uh, my work within this realm was looking at a long-term cropping system trial in Wisconsin and trying to understand how long-term management is affecting the buildup of both free and physically protected organic matter. We know that organic matter takes a long time to build up, so we hope that after 20 to 25 years of cropping system uh, management that was consistent, we would be able to see some differences in those organic matter pools. So this is the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial. It was started just north of uh, Madison in Arlington in 1989. Uh, the soil is a Plano silt loam, a rich mollusol. And you can see we have six different crop rotation systems here. They were designed to mimic on-farm situations. So unlike standard research where you might vary tillage over the same rotation or vary rotation over the same tillage treatment, these combine tillage, rotation, and fertilizer inputs all together. So I'll walk you through them. We uh, consider them in two categories, essentially. Grain systems on top, which are meant to represent any farm dependent on cash grain sales in Wisconsin. We have the continuous corn system, which is chisel plowed in the fall. We have a corn-soybean two-year rotation, which is no-till in soy, strip-till in corn. We have a three-year organically managed system, which is a corn-soy wheat um, and receives some more cultivation for tillage. 
And the, so the two conventional grain systems receive urea ammonium nitrate, and the organic system receives pelletized chicken manure. And then we have three forage systems on the bottom. Since Wisconsin is such a big dairy state, it's important to have some representative uh, dairy forage systems in our trial. And we have both a conventional and an organic uh, alfalfa corn rotation, and then also a rotationally grazed pasture where we do have heifers on the land for um, over the summer months. And both the alfalfa rotations also receive manure. Um, so this trial has been in place for 25 years, as I said. It's replicated in uh, time as well as space, so every phase of every rotation is present every year. We sampled from the corn phase of all systems, except the pasture, of course, where there is no corn. And we did this sampling in 2012 and 2013 to look at the organic matter buildup after that long period of time. So first I'm going to talk about the particulate organic matter, which is the little pink blobs in my cartoon, and which represents that most recent input to the soil. And you can see here the systems are along the bottom axis and the palm carbon concentration on the y-axis. Uh, the nitrogen uh, data look very similar, so I'm just going to show carbon. Uh, and you see we have two depths, but only the 0 to 25 centimeter depth shows significant differences among systems. So what jumps out right away, I think, are that the forage systems have higher palm carbon and nitrogen, and the annual systems, the grain systems, have less palm carbon and nitrogen. And uh, we can explain that maybe through tillage, right? Annual tillage is going to increase aeration of the soil and increase um, access of microbes to the palm, decompose it faster. And we can also maybe explain it by the below ground biomass in a perennial system, which has more roots year round, which can contribute to palm. So we looked at that relationship specifically between below ground biomass carbon and palm. And you can see here that, um, let's see, we averaged the below ground biomass carbon inputs over 20 years of the trial. So we took all the data from all the years and put in some correction factors for root exudates and turnover. And then that's what we took as the average below ground biomass input for each of the systems. And you can see it's divided into two categories. And that actually represents the grain systems on the left, which have much lower below ground biomass carbon. And then the forage systems on the right have much higher below ground biomass carbon. And we found this positive relationship with that and POM. So we're confirming something a lot of researchers have found, which is that below ground biomass carbon contributes really significantly to soil organic matter, more so than above ground biomass. Um, now I'm going to switch to talk about the aggregate carbon and nitrogen. This is that protected carbon and nitrogen. Uh, I separated aggregates by size. As I said, the macro aggregates are greater than 250 microns. Micros are 53 to 250, and silt and clay is less than 53 microns. And I just used uh, sieves of different sizes to do this. The second part, I tried to get at those components of macro aggregates. As I showed you, macro aggregates are made up of all these components, and micro aggregates within macro aggregates are going to be more protected than micro aggregates outside of macro aggregates. So we separated out the coarse particulate organic matter, micros within macros, and silt and clay within macros. And note in my cartoon, I don't have any free silt and clay represented, but we assume there's a lot of soil particles that are not aggregated, that are not closely associated with other particles. So as I show you a couple of figures from this data, there's going to be um, colored bars representing each aggregate fraction, and the three macro aggregate fractions uh, will be represented, but not macro aggregates by themselves. So it looks like this. This is the distribution of soil by weight into aggregate classes. You can see we have micros, silt and clay, and then the three occluded fractions um, in the striped pink bars. And what really jumps out here, again, is that the um, organic system is depleted in macroaggregate uh, formation, and also in those occluded macroaggregates within, or, I'm sorry, occluded microaggregates within macroaggregates. And that's made up for by having more unaggregated silt and clay in that organic grain system. Uh, this one is pretty similar. It shows the carbon and nitrogen stock in macroaggregates. Instead of adding up to 100% of soil weight, we're adding up to the uh, total stock of carbon or nitrogen in these systems. And you can see, again, the forage systems have more macroaggregate carbon and nitrogen, and the organic system is a little bit depleted in that macroaggregate carbon and nitrogen, as, as is the continuous corn and the strip-till system a little bit, um, but especially that organic system. 
And so I'm going to pick on the organic system because we're here to talk about organic agriculture and also um, because I think it's really fascinating that a system designed to build soil health, to build soil, is not actually building soil organic matter in this case. So this is the organic system as we represented it before. It's a three-year rotation. We're trying to increase diversity uh, according to national organic program guidelines. That's a, a goal of an organic system. But in this case, uh, corn is the highest yielding crop in this rotation by far. So we've increased diversity, but we've lowered the biomass that we produce on this land. And I showed you that relationship between palm carbon and biomass. And we had a similar relationship between aggregate carbon and nitrogen and biomass. So in this case, even though diversity has a lot of benefits for breaking up pest and disease cycles and diversifying your investment on your farm, it's not really helping us build soil organic matter because it's producing less biomass over time, even with that cover crop at the end. Uh, these are the tillage events in the organic system. The yellow ones represent annual fall tillage, which is similar to what you would do in a conventional system. And the others are for weed control. And you can see this is done as needed in the organic system, but it works out to many times per year. I think that we're suffering a huge hit on soil organic matter because of the extra tillage in this system. So uh, the implications here are that our tillage is not killing just weeds, and that as we're increasing diversity, we also need to think about still having high yielding, high biomass crops if we want to build soil organic matter. My recommendations for addressing this are not new things. I think organic no-till has huge potential um, to benefit soil health, and I know Aaron Silva in Wisconsin and others around the country are really working on making that happen. I think it's an important research project. Uh, secondly, including perennials in rotation gives us that below ground biomass, all that root biomass, and that could have a huge effect. And lastly, um, I think there's a manure effect here that I haven't talked about too much, but the WIC system receives uh, pelletized chicken manure, and it's been shown that dairy and swine manure have more ability to build soil structure over time. So if we think about inputs of manure or perhaps compost, they might be more effective at uh, adding soil carbon if we're not building the biomass. Um, yeah, so my research just suggests overall that organic managers need to be very diligent about keeping up their biomass and minimizing their tillage if they want to build soil organic matter. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have for a few minutes before we move on. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, I was going to ask, I just did a review of long-term sites around the country, and I did look at Wixit. And I couldn't really tell from reading the literature um, if these rotations were based on typical rotations in the area because I know, for example, in Iowa at our long-term site, we sat down with farmers and mimicked what they were doing. And I don't know of anybody that does wheat without falling with alfalfa or intercropping with uh, or overseeding with red clover or something like that. I mean, I think that would really affect it to have yeah. a legume. A yeah. perennial legume? Yeah, a, there is a little easier. clover in this system, but okay. it hasn't been very well established over the years, so yeah. I agree that that legume presence may be lacking here. In terms of the design of WIXT, it was uh, designed with the consultation of extension agents and farmers um, under the guidance of Josh Posner 25 years ago. Um, so perhaps part of what's happening is that we're still doing a system that was prevalent 25 years ago, and in order to like look at the long-term effect, we're hesitant to change that, even though probably we could do things better based on what we know now. And that's the tension within that long-term trial, I think. Right. This will be a good time to, to change it. We're, we're going to change ours, too, after 12 years. So, yeah. you know, a 25-year mark is a good point. And yeah. now to go back and revisit yeah. better rotations. Thanks. I was actually, our, our, the organization I used to work for, Michael Fields Agricultural Institute, was involved in the planning right. of those rotations. And actually, that three-year rotation always was a difficult rotation. One, though, that was of interest to farmers who were transitioning, mm -hmm. who didn't have livestock, right. and were transitioning to uh, um, organic or, or more organic systems. It brought small grains into the rotation. It even brought clover into the rotation. That was viewed as a plus. Yeah. It never did do so well in the wixed in yeah. terms of yields. And so you have a kind of a system where you probably do have a priming effect by turning under the green manure 
you have problems with the red clover. The corn and the red clover don't really seem to like each other. There's there's difficulties in getting good 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 yields of corn after the red clover. Believe it or not. Yeah. And and so it always has been a problem rotation, but still of interest to farmers because that's yeah. a, a stepping point whereby they can get out of corn soybeans. Right. It's a slight increase in diversity, and it doesn't require you to have livestock to feed forage to. So it's just all in that simple cash grain system. It's interesting that your results kind of contradict what uh, Michelle Wander published a number of years ago when right. she compared those studies. And Kathleen, I don't know if you've kind of revisited some of that, but those right. were, I think, nine out of ten were kind of temperate Midwest systems. One was California, yeah. and every one of them showed increase in palm and total C, but yeah. palm more so than uh, in the organic with legume or with manure? I, there was right. Really no I think difference. they use both, um, but occasionally one or the other. Yeah, and that's part of why we are surprised in this study. You know, we designed the study using Michelle Wander's method um, because this method of separating palm has been shown to be really sensitive to organic management, to management in general, and to mostly show organic management being higher in palm. And I do think that might be due to the manure. Um, I'm not positive, of course, but I think that having that regular manure input is a real structural thing and a, uh, is building palm in a way that the chicken manure is not. And possibly all, also having more legumes in rotation. Yeah, because you're right, I'm also surprised that we don't match our results. All right, thank you so much.